know, it's the other thing you find as well with microphones. You get what are called, you know, good microphones like your Neumanns and the SE mics, the SE Gemini is a great mic, you know, for the money and it works really well. What you find, especially with singers, is it's not necessarily the better the mic, it's just what mic works on their voice. Um, <coughs> Freddie Mercury, a lot of his later vocals were done on a mic called an SM78, which is basically an SM58 that's just got slightly better frequency response on the top end. Uh, Bono from U2, again, uses a handheld dynamic mic, often a 58 or something similar. So Phil Collins or Bayer MD88, it's just whatever they like singing with. And I've done things before where we had a singer, um, the first time we'd worked with her, so we didn't know what, what mic to use. So what I'll generally do is set three or four mics up and ask her just to go along and sing into each one, and then we compare and have a listen. And we had a vintage Neumann uh, 48, which belonged to Whitfield Street, which I've used on loads of people, and I know it's a fantastic sounding mic. Uh, Madonna used it when she was recording there. It's just, it's just a brilliant mic. And the thing with those valve mics, they do all sound quite different, but we know this one's a really good one. I had a Neumann 87, I had an SE Gemini, and I had this really cheap SE mic that's about 300 quid. I think it's called an Isis or something they'd sent us to try out. And the Isis sounded, on her voice, for this particular song, the Isis just sounded head and shoulders above the others. I mean, it, it was quite coloured in that it had quite an inherent built-in EQ, but it just really worked. So um, we ended up using it for that track. So. When you, when you auto-tune, does the mic make any difference? Yeah. No, I haven't found that. Um, as, as long as it's uh, just, just a single voice, then, then the mic doesn't really play much, much part in that. Um, Yeah, that's going to be hard, but it's not so much the mic or the way it's recorded. It, it's it's to do with the auto tune. If it's if it's looking, if, if two people are singing, they're going to be very slight. Even if they're both singing in tune, their their tonality is going to be slightly different. It's the auto tune is going to not know which one to pitch, or it's going to try and do both of them, and that's where you're running into the problems. So, if if you have them individually, obviously it's much better and easier to to try and tune them individually. Um, sometimes with vocalists, mic placement is quite important because some of them, um, some of them move around a lot. You know, they get a bit animated and singing. And obviously, if if they're on a very sensitive cardioid mic, it, it's going to become more apparent than if they're on a dynamic mic. Uh, and also, depending how far from the mic. So one trick is um, with some singers, if if they either if they either have, insist on getting too close on the mic, and and it can just sound overloaded or they might project um, spittle and spit from their mouth which sometimes gets in the diaphragm and can affect the sound of it. Um, often what we do is we'll put what we call a dummy mic, it still have a cable in it and stuff but we're not using it there and it might even have pop shield on it and then they can get up as close as they like but four inches behind is maybe quite a sensitive expensive cardioid mic that's picking it all up. And, and it just means, also if they move a lot, because if you've got one mic here and they're moving a lot, it's going to be quite hard. So if you put that one mic there, but set one just a little bit back, then although they're moving a lot on this one, it, it's going to be moving a lot less on that one because it is picking up from slightly further back. You've obviously got to be a bit careful, because if it's too far away, there's not going to be enough presence on the sound, but lots of little tricks like that. Sorry? It does a little bit, but... In some ways, what the change that it makes is better than it being sounding on mic, off mic, on mic, off mic. Um, because some people just move like, or, or they have a tendency to read their lyrics all the time, so they're constantly going like this. And, uh, and you try and get them to hold it there, but then they're moving, and it, you just have to see what works with the singer. People are different. Um, headphone mixes for singers as well as the other ones. Some people. Some love their voice really loud, quiet, others pitch to different things. So some of them, if, if you don't have enough bass, their tuning goes, you know. It depends what they, 
it, it'll be what they tune to. So some will always tune to the keyboard sound on the track, some will do the bass. So often if, if, the tuning, if, if they're consistently singing out a tune, it's often worth sort of trying to change the headphone mix a bit and see if it improves or gets worse. Or asking them, what, you know, having a chat with them and saying, oh, you know, what are you pitching to? Or does this help and turn the bass or the piano up? Because uh, normally there's a way around it. It's normally for a reason. Because often, you know, they'll sing in the control room and sound in tune, then as soon as they put headphones on. Sometimes it's because they can't hear their own voice, so they take one ear off and their, their pitching comes back. Or vice versa. I've seen people put one can off because they're inexperienced and they've seen people do it and think that that's what you do in a studio. And then the pitching's off and you get them to put the other one on, it comes back again. So just experiment. D don't worry about, don't be frightened to try anything. You know, if you've got a compressor that's designed for one thing and you want to try it on something else, try it, you know, or if, you've got, if you want to put your snare, you know, I saw a guy that, um, <coughs> he, he had a, I went in one studio, he had a drum kit set up and he had a didgeridoo set up next to it and at the end of it he had a mic and he was recording that as well and feeding it through a Sans amp and it sounded like, what's he doing that for? But when he had it in his mix, it was great, it was a quirky little thing and it made this weird sound and then the fact he'd screwed it up through a Sans amp. And, you know, obviously I've seen him do it, so I know what it does, but he must have one day thought, oh, I think I'll try that. And it must have seemed a bit wacky to everyone at the time, but it worked. So, you know, don't be, don't be frightened of trying things. There aren't really any rules, or if they are, they're there to be pushed and bent a bit and broken sometimes. So. Anything else I can... Uh Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. I'm better at it now. I used to hear hear something and go, oh, I could have got that, but I should have done that, and could have done that, and you drive yourself mad. But I don't, I don't get that so much now. Um, now you've asked. I have to try and think of something. Um, I do like this song when it comes in, when I hear it on the radio, because as well, I've heard it in a cinema, which is quite different. Normally, you, you often get to hear tracks you've worked on the radio, but to hear one in a cinema, that's quite nice. You go, oh, yeah. I did this, or yeah, I remember doing that. Or sometimes it might not even be so much about the track, it might just be about the whole process you had recording it or the fun you had on that session, and it can just you know, make you feel good. Um, I'm quite proud of, we did, um, when I was doing some stuff with Queen, and then um, Freddie got approached to, to do a, a song for the Barcelona Olympics called Barcelona, and he was gonna work with this opera singer, and we did this track called Barcelona. And I'm pretty proud of that because it's, it's very epic sounding. And uh, it had quite an unorthodox approach because we, um, it's all very orchestrated and classical sounding and big and epic. But because it was, it, it wasn't, he had the bare bones of it. He'd written the sort of basic song on piano and the lyrics but he was kind of writing for an opera singer that he hadn't worked with. She was going to come and work with him, but he'd never worked with her. So therefore, as we were doing it, we knew that things might change because we didn't know if it was going to be exactly the right key for her. We could have a good guess and things like that. So rather than going and record it with an orchestra, um, the guy Freddie was working with was this guy called Mike Moran. He's a, he he co-wrote the song as well. He's a composer, does a lot of, lot of film and TV music. He's a fantastic player, but he's a great arranger, string arranger. So what he did was, we didn't use any real instruments to start with. We, he built it all up using, um, they had a sampler at the time called an emulator. And um, it was just basically a sample player and it had a reasonably good library. But what he would do is rather than just get up a string patch and go strings and play them, he'd get up a violin patch and he'd do one part, then he'd do another part. So it was like he played every part in the orchestra and he'd build it up that way and then he'd get a viola sample and play that line. So it was, instead of having 16 string players, he'd play 16 different tracks with different samples. And we built it up that way. And then that, that, when we needed to change anything, it was very easy to change. If we'd done it conventionally, it would have been very much, oh, we've got to get the orchestra back next week, change that. And then a week later, oh, that's changed now, so we're going to do that. And we'd have just been forever doing that. So. Mm -hmm.